Since the first appearance of a new coronavirus from China about two months ago, global spread of the disease and now local cases have sent a jittery public looking for answers. So we turn now to the scientists for those answers. And we have some good ones with us this morning. Dr. Eileen Marty is a professor of infectious diseases at Florida International University. She's a new U.S. Navy vet, worked with the World Health Organization, most recently in the fight against Ebola. Dr. Jose Castro is a physician and infectious disease specialist at the University of Miami Medical School. His teaching and research focus on, among other things, infection control. Good morning. Great to have you come so in. So great Thank to you. have you. Good morning. We should do the uh, elbow bump. Yeah, well, let's, let's <laughs> well, truth, all do that. Truth be told, we've already hugged and kissed other people today. So, you know, that, that's an actually a great place to start. How concerned, generally speaking, in this place and time should people be about living and doing things like that? That's a complex question because it does have to do with who you're hugging and kissing, right, and how old they are. And the same things that what are their risk factors and what are your risk factors for having come in contact with this particular virus before you do your hugging and kissing. So the better you know the person, you live with the person, for example, go ahead and hug and kiss, mm -hmm. right, and then take it from there. Uh, Dr. Castro, let me ask you, I feel in everyday life over the last week or so, an increasing level of anxiety in our community among people I deal with, people I work with. Um, I think we are all taking, you know, doing fist bumps and washing our hands a lot. How, how concerned, how much anxiety, how much uh, worry should we have these days? Um, I think uh, this is a new disease and, you know, the anxiety is understandable. It's transmissible between humans. Um, and it's spreading, as we know, in different parts of the world. Yeah. <clears throat> However, uh, the lethality, how many people die when they catch the infection, is um, probably around, you know, around 1% or less. Um, okay, can I just interrupt you for a moment to yes. say what the... What we're hearing is 3%, which, which is... Yeah, there's a lot of a lot controversy more. because the actual number of people infected is unknown. Ah. So at the end, we see most people who are sick and get into the hospital. Um, maybe um, one uh, example we can take where it was kind of experiment, natural experiment, was one of these cruises where everyone was tested. And what we know from that cruise is the mortality was relatively, it was less than that number. So probably less than 1%. That, you know, is, is very low, but when you talk about population, it still is high. You know, um, that, that's a really interesting characterization because right now off, off the coast of South Florida, off Port Everglades, there's a cruise ship. Uh, two of the crew members need to be tested because they came off the ship that's off San Diego. Uh, I don't want anyone to think that there's a cruise ship full of people that might be infected or, or may be because, to your point, we just don't know. But, Dr. Marty, there are uh, now in South Florida two, two cases, presumptive cases in Broward County. But is it fair to think that there are very many more cases of people who just don't mm -hmm. know it yet? Well, that's why we need to do surveillance. We need to get a real handle on the data. We need to get that numerator and denominator so that we actually understand what the risk factors are. It was done in China, and because they were, it's, a, it's the type of government w that will test you whether you want to or not. <laughs> and so, and so e for every single case that they found, they tested every single family member, and they tested not just every single family member, but every single close contact of that case. Can you go and, and what you, you were explaining to us earlier, and I would love for our audience to hear what surveillance actually means taking a sort of poll of sorts in a very scientific way of testing. Can, can you go into a little bit of that detail so people understand that? Well, you've already, you've, you've already done it perfectly. It is basically polling different populations to get a real sense of what's going on, to, to, get, to get an understanding of this entire outbreak. Now, unfortunately, the data from China does indicate a higher than 1% mm -hmm. uh, fatality rate, and they identified asymptomatic cases doing this type of intense testing of so many people. 
Uh, but most of those asymptomatic patients that were tested and were asymptomatic at the time that they were positive eventually showed symptoms. Well, I want to talk about more surveillance, but Dr. Castro, let me just ask you, if somebody is watching this who has a fever of 100 or so, uh, has a dry cough, uh, has an underlying health condition, maybe has uh, diabetes or lupus or something, and they are wondering whether they should be tested, what should they do? Yes, um, so we have to understand, and probably uh, the public has to, to you know, learn what we're learning. This disease has a spectrum of presentations. Uh, we're learning that overwhelming majority, you know, about probably 80%, will have a mild disease. Mm -hmm. Mild disease that would not require to be admitted to the hospital, yeah. so probably, you know, just talking to your doctor over the phone, just, you know, regular. Staying home, treating staying yourself over-the-counter meds kind of thing? Yes. Well, well let, let's be very, very clear, right? I mean, he's correct. Technically, 80% of, of people do not require hospitalization, but in that 80% is just as you said, a range, and uh, a little over half of that range is a walking pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And people will feel lousy, and they will need to be, and one of the things that Dr. Castro and I had the pleasure of talking about ahead of time is the value of what we call telemedicine. So it's not, we, we don't have to just do a phone call. We can actually see the patient, interact with the patient, almost as if they were in mm -hmm. our office without any risk of contagion. Um, and, 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 and also be clear that if a person progresses from that mild m or moderate state mm -hmm. to a more s serious state, we have to have protocols in place so that we can then uh, bring them into a facility and get them the additional care that they might need. So everybody who has, it's, it's flu season. I mean, people yes. are sick and yes. not necessarily having anything to do with coronavirus. So it, <clears throat> is what you're saying to be heard I'm not feeling so well, I'm staying home, I'm not gonna freak out, you know, if you are a normal, healthy person. Mm -hmm. And I may call my doctor to see where this goes, not jumping in and saying, oh my gosh, I better get a test. Is, is that fair to say? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so, uh, as I said, you know, most of the people who have a mild disease, some less percentage will have a more severe disease with higher fever. Those are the ones who probably have a pneumonia and some of them will eventually have a deadly disease. Certainly that group are the ones who will require to be in the hospital with additional measures, some other therapies. Yeah. Um, and it's not a random, this, you know, uh, uh, who, who's going to be so sick. As we're learning, there are certain <coughs> factors uh, that will make people who carry those factors to be in this group that can be very sick. As you know, we're seeing. As uh, we're seeing. Yes. And that's, you know, age. As you age, your mm -hmm. chances to become... So 70 yeah. and above, you would begin to get much higher risk and likelihood of mortality. I mean, I see 70 to 80, I think I saw the figure was like a 15% mortality rate for a, you know, fatal case of yes. coronavirus. The Lancet study had it at 14.8% over the age of 80. The WHO study with Bruce Alward had it at over eight, it, people who are over 80 having a 21.9% oh. chance of mortality. Okay. We, uh, we'll pick up right here when we come right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. On this Sunday, we are with two medical specialists, two physicians who are infectious disease specialist, Dr. Eileen Marty from FIU, Dr. Jose Castro from the University of Miami Medical School. So Dr. Marty, explain to us about the algorithm uh, that you want to sort of establish and what is the point here? Get good, hard, empirical data to help political and governmental leaders make decisions about how to address this? Right, so um, this is being spearheaded by uh, Dr. Barbaricci. He's in, uh, he's in Geneva. Actually, right now he's on his way to Monaco. And he wants to set together a, a series of task forces throughout the world. And together, we'll, we'll answer to him and create a series of algorithms that any body who's holding any level of a mass gathering can go through a series of tools to make it a rational and reasonable decision as to whether or not a particular mass gathering 
is or is not at risk from COVID. Yeah, now it's anecdotal, but I mean, we heard, and I think Glenna reported this week, that the city of Miami said, well, we talked to the CDC, they said any gathering of 25,000 or more, you ought to reconsider whether you have it. And that ostensibly was one reason why the Ultra Music Festival was called off. Well, I think what that's a little bit, that's not enough data, right? Mm -hmm. the, the number of people is not enough to, to be a kickoff in any particular place. You have to take the numbers, the places where those people are coming from, the right. situation in those places, and the, and the area and various different factors of the community into consideration. And those are part of what will fit into the algorithm so that then decision makers can do appropriate and reasonable planning. That obviously. has been very confusing to a lot of people yeah. this week. Dr. Castro, one of the, along the same lines, information coming out of the people who now in Florida are if, uh, infected and even who have passed from this um, has been very basic. We know gender, we know county, we know age. But people are, are craving detail for their own benefit, for their own decisions. Where in Broward were these people? Might I have been with them? What should mm -hmm. I do? What prevents, uh, under the guise of uh, privacy law, is what the health officials are saying that we can't release anymore. How, how far does HIPAA, the federal privacy law dealing with medical issues, how far does that go? And what can we know to allow us to make better decisions about these cases? Yeah. Um, well, uh, the information that we have from Florida you know, with a few uh, cases that we know is probably anecdotal. And just it's really important to know the local epidemiology, but still we don't have the tools. And the, by the tools uh, means what Dr. Mari said about doing screening in the population. Uh, my, my question was, why can't we know more about these Broward cases, about these people? Where have they been? Where do they live generally? What, where, what stores had they visited and might I have been there? Yeah. Why can't we Specifically know Specifically that? that, typically the health department will do an investigation. Typically they <coughs> do case tracing. They get into you know, the, the, what they call index case and they collect information, you know, who has been in contact with them. Yeah. Uh, and they, do, they should be doing testing to see the well, people around. They haven't them. been very forthcoming, I have to say. Before we run out of time, I just hear two great physicians. I want to ask you to give our audience, give us, some really good solid information. You had said during a break that you're kind of sick of this advice. You know, wash your hands for 20 seconds, sing the birthday song, and that's it. I mean, you, you're saying wash your hands longer than 20 seconds? We've always said it's a 40 to 60 second hand wash. We've always insisted that you've got to clean under your fingernails by rubbing your, your fingers like this and paying attention to each mm -hmm. and every digit. That takes time, each and every digit and the wrist, and then, of course, lathering. And once you do that, you don't have to bother counting because it's going to be 40 to 60 right. seconds, and you're going to do a better job. I'm going to look forward to the tutorial on YouTube that you are going to make <laughs> about how exactly to wash hands. Well, don't forget that a lot of that hand washing comes with drying of the hands, so let's remember to moisturize if we're doing all this hand washing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, we actually found that out firsthand. All right, and no it, touching your face, yeah. your eyes, your nose, your mouth, uh, and uh, hand sanitizer? Um, yes, not touching is, um, is very important, but it's not easily done, and sometimes we just do it without being conscious. So yes. really emphasis in the hand washing very often. And if anything good will have left this uh, outbreak will be that message. We have to keep washing our hands throughout the day. And surfaces. Yes. We have to keep our surfaces as clean as possible right. so that and what we touch and isn't that sense. big a deal. <laughs> yes, common, common sense. sense and don't panic. That's yes, right. Yes, okay. absolutely. All right. So Dr. great to Marty, have you here. Dr. Thank Dr. you so Castro, much. Great to have you come in. Thanks for having us. All right, up next we're going to take coronavirus and several other big stories like Super Tuesday to the roundtable.